And now I hit record again. Now let's go back over here. Okay. All right. So we are again recording. Let me just make sure I'm not telling a giant story. Yes, we are recording. All right. And then uh, for this one, what do you think? Maybe uh, 10 minutes? That was four sure. minutes and 16 seconds. Yeah. I mean, that was, yeah, that I, I can hold forth. Hang on a sec. I'm, I've got a giant smudge on my glasses here. And, oh, uh, look, that, and that's good contact information, right? Casey at MightyCasey.com? Yeah. yeah. Okay. All right. Good. So, yeah, uh, that, what do you want that, that goes to my Gmail inbox, so it's fine. Yeah. Okay. So you want to, uh, what do you want to shoot for, 10, 12 minutes on this one? Oh, let's go for maximum of 10. Okay. All righty. Well, welcome back to the Society for Participatory Medicine. This is John Hoban with Casey Quinlan uh, following up on that brief piece we just did regarding the X article that was published in BMC Online. Casey, uh, one of the things that you highlighted was to try to be able to use the, the article, which, by the way, um, the, uh, the title, or ultimately what you're trying to do is to have a platform between layperson patients that are presenting a problem with a physician to then be in as the practicing physician and obviously the, the professional and to use the internet or online communications in a way that is going to ultimately benefit the clinical outcomes for everybody. I mean, well, that's it's ultimately... Not, yeah, it's not... And, and, and to be clear, it's not just online. Um, I think that, that what drove this paper's birth, as it were, uh, was... Uh, and, and Glenn references this in the, in the opening of the article, that last year the, um, the Belgian government... Uh, you know, produced a PSA that was widely decried in the patient community. That basically, they you know, they, the Belgian Center for Evidence-Based Medicine um, was you know created a video telling patients not to Google before going to see their doctor. In other words, don't Google it. And there, were, I mean, it was ridiculous. It made it made it look like patients were hurting themselves by looking for information online, which huh. is bushwa to put it politely. Right. And it was that, that that particular video campaign was widely decried and then got pulled because, I mean, it's still out there because it's yeah. hard to kill anything on the Internet once it's there. <laughs> but, um, but and it also references Archie Cochran, who 40 years ago that he said that, um, that there really isn't a lot of easily accessible critical summary of all of the science that we learn by doing trials and studies and research and by we you know meaning the the, the medical profession and the there's been a, a sort of an ongoing movement on the clinical side to come up with really good guidelines and evidence-based medicine as opposed to throwing magic beans and um, and then on the on the patient side there is a deep thirst for knowledge that we can trust and then between the two and the relationship to have care you know customized um, sort of you know practice tools that both sides can use to as as both communication levers and also as selection guides now for example Glenn Elwin who is the doctor who was the lead author on this uh -huh. uh, has created a thing called the Collaborate Score, um, and I mean, if you go and and all you have to do is Google Glenn Ilwin, um, spell it this way, G L Y N, last name E L W Y N, and that's his Twitter handle is his it, you know is his name at Glenn Ilwin, and the Dartmouth Preferences Lab, and there's he's created things called you know Option Grids, which you can dive in and you know I think it's on Option Grids. Dot com or option dash grids or anyway if you google option grids you can find some of the grids that have been created to help with the um, the sort of the treatment decision planning for uh, anything from you know breast cancer to you know cardiac stuff etc and then there's the collaborate score that I know that um, they're using to assess whether or not a patient feels as though they got all the information that they needed from the clinical encounter. Mm -hmm. But the point really is that, you know, all the science in the world doesn't do much for you if the other side of the conversation either can't access it or doesn't understand it. 
And it's not that every doctor needs to walk into, uh, you know, an exam room with, you know, like Grey's Anatomy and, you know, like uh, flip charts and, you know, now we're going to have a two-hour workshop on diabetes. Yeah. No, that is not, that's not going to work either. But coming up with um, easy to use and then, you know, sort of take it home and use it at home and then come back or ask questions via the portal, etc. But just, you know, understanding how to make a shared decision with, um, you know, science, with an understanding of what the different outcomes are, what the risks are in, in different treatments, um, and sort of what the patient really wants to wind up with, what, whatever that is. And, uh, you know, there was something that I was reading just today about, um, you know, shared decision making and looking at patient outcomes and making treatment decisions around head and neck cancer was one study that was being done. And, um, that it, you know, the doctors thought that survival was number one, that always survival was like the thing, you know, we have to tell them that they're going to survive and that, you know, give them the numbers on survival. But patients assumed given, you know, the information that they'd had, that, that their chances of survival were pretty good, they were more interested in being able to talk and swallow. And, I mean, with head and neck cancer, if you've ever had, you know, if you've ever had radiation treatment, you suddenly know why the talking and swallowing thing could become a thing in, oh, yeah. in head and neck cancer treatment. But, you know, I mean, that's just, it's one of those things where no, you know, either, oh, well, we didn't ask the question right because we didn't understand what the outcome was. But really, this, you know, the desired outcome was on the patient side. But, the, you know, the real deal is here is that people are going to go out and they're going to be proactive on their own behalf. They're going to try to get information so that when they show up, they're not just like, I don't know what's going on. Tell me, doc, I'm just a dumb old amoeba here. No, that's not the case. I mean, I don't know anybody who goes in to a clinical encounter with that mindset personally. And I'm sure that there are plenty of people who really do, you know, they, they I don't know what's going on and I need your help to figure it out. But every patient who goes in to see a doctor, whatever their education level, their, you know, whatever their cognitive abilities are, they go in to get some help. And they want to be smart on their own behalf. So they want the information that will help them get better. And that often means bringing stuff in. I know I always look I mean, and you know, unless I'm going in for like a cold or you know, whatever, and I don't go to a doctor for a cold anyway. But they say, you know, I end up with a sinus infection after a cold. I go in and I, you know, I go in and I, I just want the doctor to tell me, you know, look and tell me and give me something or tell me to go home. It's going to go away or you know, whatever. But when it's something a little more complicated, you want to know what you're facing and then be able to walk through the options so that you know what the possibilities are and then assess that against your own willingness to deal. I mean, there are some people that would happily give up a body part if it meant that they continued to live. There are other people who would look at that and say, well, I don't know, quality of life hmm, might not be great. Let's look at, you know, other options here. So it really is helping people make decisions that matter to them as opposed to just getting yanked through on a conveyor belt or, you know, an assembly line without like, wait a minute, what, what? And so that's what the point was. From a, uh, from a customized care tool perspective, how do you see the, uh, to what extent is precision medicine or personalized medicine come into play in that tool set? Well, we're kind of at the dawn of that right now. I, I think that um, when you say personalized medicine right now, the best that anybody can get to is uh, it is based more on communication than it is on, um, you know, a DNA assay. Uh, mm -hmm. Although, I mean, obviously a DNA assay can give you information like what your BRCA status is, you know, other genetic information about specific diseases. But as far as um, actual granular treatment options based on your DNA assay, uh, that's not really here yet. There are clinical trials. There are, there are some treatments that... Yes, target specifically, you know, one, you know, one type of genetic, as, you know, problem or other. But um, as far as precision medicine and personalized medicine goes, I think that looking at developing this kind of customized care tool will help deliver that. So this is, you know, one of those initial steps. 
in creating a personalized slash precision medicine platform where without patient input, um, you know, there, you know, I think that the you know the history of medicine is littered with things where you know, well, we thought that was a good idea. We thought that's what you wanted, you know, and um, you know things uh, things that you know, like wait a minute, once you guys told me what was really going on, I don't want that. No, that's not what I want. And uh, you know, there's it, there's a lot of history. If you Google, um, well, if you if you Google, uh, you know, erroneous medical treatment or medical error or you know it, it, things that sh that medicine shouldn't have done, you pack a lunch, you'll be there for years. But um, but the bottom line is, it has to be you know precision medicine and, and personalized medicine has to be based on a conversation. It has to be based on a shared understanding, and has to be driven by what the patient ultimately wants to get out of this, whatever it is. And building tools like that that can be interactive, that can be deployed without necessarily a doctor and a patient have to be you know like okay now we're here we can start the clock. Um, you know, because there's, I know that the, the way that medicine is reimbursed in the United States is based on the office visit or the clinical visit or whatever, but, and that's going to have to shift around this model that I'm talking about, but it has to include, um, you know, digital tools that are, that, um, you know, have the scientific information embedded in them that let patients walk their way through different options with the help of their doctors. In other words, you know, this is a tool, in other words, somebody could prescribe that you go take, you know, your doctor could prescribe that you go and, um, you know, walk through, say, the three options that are present, you know, that are, that are there for you with whatever condition you're confronting, the three different treatment options. And looking at the outcomes of each one and, and understanding how to, how to look at those percentages and then um, make your decision, and then you come back for a follow-up visit, as opposed to taking hours and hours and hours sitting there, you know, drawing maps on, on you know, together on a, on a, you know, on a whiteboard. Right. Um, I mean, not as though that isn't useful, but I think that uh, it, it could happen asynchronously, which is a way to free up clinical time so that people can go and, you know, use tools that, um, that work for them, that they can understand, and then come back with a, okay, doc, I've identified treatment number two as the thing I want to do, and let me just walk through this for five minutes so that I make sure that I understand, and it's like, okay, great, okay, we're going for treatment two. But coming up with that sort of granular tool that a patient can go and use on their own is going to be required for precision and personalized medicine because you can't put people on a conveyor belt if it's supposed to be personal. Right. Yep. Contradiction in terms. Well, Casey, thank you so much for joining me today. This is John Hoban, and if you have any follow-up questions, you can contact Casey directly. Her email address is Casey at MightyCasey.com. Or at MightyCasey on Twitter. Yeah, precisely. Thanks so much, Casey. Thank you. All righty. Well, I will, um, oh, God, I will stop the recording. Stop.